Okay, so we're going to talk about dependency ejection at a high level. Um, set the focus there. Nope. Practice, but not backwards. Okay, so we're using Pimple as a container. Um, the, the impetus for this talk was uh, basically, um, I'm a participant in OCPHP, and they wanted to create a mini PHP camp here. And so um, I try to contribute back as much as I can, but I often have a lot of priorities. And um, as has happened here, I've, I've tried to squeeze it in. So um, there's going to be a lot of gaps, but I'm hoping that we can have a good discussion here. Um, but so, so one of the things that's coming to Drupal is, with Drupal 8 is that it's based on Symfony. And, and so one of the core components of Symfony is Pimple, which is a, a lightweight dependency injection container. So we'll get a little more into that. Um, so who am I? Uh, my name's Pete Warnock. I've um, been developing PHP for 12 years. I've been an architect for the last three. And then um, four months ago, um, I became an engineer, uh, Q4 Media. Um, we also do magazines for uh, the Enthusiast Network, uh, Motor Trend, Automobile Mag, whatnot. Um, but we're building a, a content platform um, to take out to a lot of media industries. Um, and so while we're a Zen Framework 2 shop, on the on the web tier, um, these patterns are consistent across frameworks. And so, whether it's Laravel or Drupal or um, Symfony or Zen or even other languages, Java, Spring made um, inversion of control really popular. Um, you'll see that these these patterns transcend. And so, like even you know Angular um, will use a lot of this too. So, um, let's see. So friends call me Pete. So. Um, so to set some assumptions, um, I geared this towards an intermediate audience. Um, so for those of you that have experience, we can have a, a better discussion. But um, I just uh, for a lot of um, uh, community developers, uh, some of these things are new. Um, and so these are practices that we've been doing on the enterprise side for a while. Uh, they help make the code a lot more maintainable. Um, and so uh, the goal is to uh, re-familiarize ourselves with the D and solid. Um, so uh, and then we want to go over some of the additional design patterns because when I interview a lot of people, you know, the common patterns that are known are MVC or adapter, um, but not things like factory and inversion and control dependency injection. Um, so our goal is to write maintainable code. That means that we're looking at a long-term code base that can evolve. Um, we want to be able to substitute uh, different dependencies um, as newer technologies come along or we work with different vendors or whatnot. Um, and we want to write uh, simpler, faster tests. We don't want to have to wire up a database and, and do different things to, to just execute a unit test. Um, we want to be able to, to control more of the variables and, and say that I expect this response from this service. I'm testing this unit of code, and so I don't want to be concerned with making a connection to the database and whatnot. So let's talk about design patterns. Um, you know, basically they're reusable um, solutions, but they're not code specific. You can apply a design pattern to any uh, language or library. So, so dependency injection. There's there's three main styles, and um, these were popularized by Martin Fowler um, in the architecture world. He's kind of like set the standard with um, patterns for enterprise architecture, and so. Um, He's, he's highly referenced, um, and so a lot of the newer frameworks, they're, they're based on um, the content that he's published over the last decade and a half. Um, so it's a very popular article that I've cited here that, that gives a, a very high-level overview, but it, it sets up the three types. Um, and so we'll be looking at constructor injection, setter injection, and lastly, interface injection. So we want to look at constructor injection. Um, it's real simple. It's just a matter of passing uh, the dependency through the constructor. Um, without uh, using constructor injection, we might hard code it to the actual dependency instantiating that inside the class. Um, but because we're passing it in, um, that gives us the ability to now um, implement different instances of the, of the interface that we want to pass through. 
and we have a setter injection. Um, we might leave the constructor empty for various reasons, um, and so uh, we sideload it through a, through a setter. And so it's very similar, um, except it happens after the object's been constructed, then we inject the dependency. And so then the interface injection is about defining the, the dependency in the interface and then applying that to the implementation um, and bringing it in that way. So dependency injection and inversion control are terms that are often interchanged, but dependency injection is a subset of inversion control. And so inversion of control involves the factory pattern, the service locator, and dependency injection. And so with the factory, what we're doing is, is we want to create objects in a, in a specific um, scope so that uh, we can control what the dependencies are. We, can, um, we know where in the code base the object creation is happening. Um, and so it, it allows us to then um, move forward with the, with the inversion of control and introduce the container. And um, as we'll see in a few minutes, uh, what the possibilities are there. Um, so factories, they can be object-based, they can be method-based, which is less popular, but um, uh, still, still a method there, and uh, function-based. And with Pimple, we'll see that we're using lambdas to do a lot of the um, factories. And so um, in the description for this presentation, I talked about how it's bad to use new inside, inside a class and create, create objects within classes, but factories are the exception to that rule. That's, that's where we expect to be um, creating objects. Um, so the service locator um, is also a common pattern um, where uh, it builds on top of um, the inversion of control and, and so you request from the service locator a service and it will go through and, and do the, the object creation and the injection and it'll go, it, it encapsulates all the functions that go into creating the object and returning back a service. Um, there's some widespread debate about how to implement it. Um, service locator can be passed by reference to a lot of different classes and in, in a lot of ways it's not much different than using globals or, or um, statics to, to change scope. So um, as a best practice in my opinion it's, it's good to keep service locators, um, have them terminate at the, inside the factory. So pass them to the factory to make all the services available for injecting dependencies into what the factory is creating. But um, beyond that, we shouldn't be passing it into um, especially our model. Um, a lot of times it'll be passed into the controller. I'm of the opinion that even the controllers we want to treat as part of the, um, the domain model. And so um, the factory is where I like to, to uh, terminate the service locator. So. so what is Pimple? It's an inversion of control container. Um, it's something that started, I don't know if it started in the Java community, but it's been around with Spring before it came to the PHP community. Um, Fabian Potentier of uh, Symphony, he introduced it probably about five years ago, uh, the predecessor to Pimple, and he brought this concept of dependency injection into the PHP community and, and setting up this container that, that could be passed around and, and it's one central look registry where you can find all your dependencies. Uh, prior to that, we were using like with Zen Framework 1, we'd have a, a global registry, but it was, it was a step above using globals. It was still um, a lot of scope issues and, and whatnot. So um, what's nice about adding all your dependencies to an object container is that the object gets passed around PHP by reference. And so um, you'll only have one instance of the dependencies and um, whereas prior to that you might be sprinkling database connections and whatnot and creating multiple services unknowingly. So let's talk about why it's bad to use new inside a class. So here's the example of where we didn't use constructor injection. So we've got a mapper, it needs to connect to the database. So we create the database connection right, right in there. The problem here is if my database server isn't working, 
this class is going to throw an exception. So how do I unit test that? Um, so what by by using construct uh, dependency injection, I, I can put in a mock PDO adapter here, and I'd be able to test the rest of the class. Um, so it's referred to as hard coding, and um, you know we want to keep things as loosely a couple as possible because it's going to allow us to uh, um, keep the code living and maintainable. Um, for unit testing, which is really important, um, uh, you know we need to be able to sim uh, substitute stubs and mocks. Um, it allows it to run much faster and and also. Uh, there's less variables to deal with. You don't have to worry about is it a network issue or why not. And I need to be able to change the implementation. PDO was popular a few years ago. Now database abstraction layers and Mongo and Elastic and all the different databases you know, are, we want to be able to change, change the, the different dependencies there and still have the same interface that our applications are built upon. So here, um, going back, uh, I'm missing a slide, but um, here we're talking about um, why it's uh, bad to use statics. Um, and here we, we declare a singleton. Um, it was a common practice um, so that we weren't creating multiple database connections. Um, so here, on the first call to the static call to get DB, we create a new um, database and set it, and then any subsequent call would return back the, the statically saved um, database connection. So it might be implemented like this, um, where we're calling the singleton and we're getting the database. The problem is, how do I sub that out without modifying the singleton? So if, if it's a library I've imported and I don't have access to change that, I'm still in the same scenario where I can't, I can't stub, I can't change the implementation. Um, and so those are the reasons that dependency injection is important. Let's see. So let's um, let's take a look at pimple here. And so fortunately, let's see. There we go. So pimple is such a lightweight lightweight library that they the documentation is one page long. Um, and fortunately, though I don't have an internet connection, I have it cached here. So um, there are two methods to install it. Um, the easiest way is to use uh, Composer. Who here is using Composer? It's our public service announcement. Great. I'm glad to see widespread adoption. So um, it's made things a lot easier, and it's, uh, it's even led to, to better code because uh, everybody's more... Um, uh, like-minded about sharing code. Uh, so the, the other way to install Pimple, which I have not done yet, um, would be to compile it as a C extension. Um, uh, I, I briefly looked for a pickle wrapper. Um, one hasn't been done yet. Um, I, I may investigate this further and then um, contribute to uh, uh, one of the libraries, uh, like on uh, Homebrew for Mac, but I mean, it'd be a limited scope. But it, it is interesting that you can install it that way so that it's native to PHP and it'd be a lot faster. Um, but here, container is it's just an object. But what happens is um, uh, encapsulate is a lot of the functionality that is going to take care of the dependency injection. So here we're defining services. Um, so we're going to define a session storage service. We're going to get that by name. But the implementation is returned back in a callback here. So inside that Lambda, we right now we're, we're instantiating session storage, but that could be you know, a different um, object that, it, that adheres to the same interface. Um, and then it also allows you to maintain your, your dependencies in, there's not specific order that you have to code it. And in a procedural world, we'd have to ensure that our dependencies are loaded in order. In this, we just have to ensure that all our dependencies are defined with callbacks, and then it will uh, load in the necessary order. So here, when we define the session, we have a dependency on the session storage. So you can see the container gets passed into this callback, 
it then initializes this, it returns back to session storage, and then it gets here, used here to instantiate the session. So um, what will happen is when this callback executes, it's going to return back the session storage object, and that's going to get um, captured inside the container so that it's, it's a run once, um, and then it's, uh, it's comparable to a singleton. That, that object lives for the rest of the, the life cycle of the request. So um, if that's not desired, we'll get down farther to, to using a, what they call a factory in here that allows you to um, return new instances on every call. But the, the common implementation is just you want a single database connection, so you request that service, it creates it, and it stores it in the container. And then accessing it, it uses an uh, array interface. Um, so it looks like an array syntax, but there's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes. Um, so either um, run the dependency injection and, and create the object, or to return the object if it's already been um, executed. So here's uh, the factory um, that I was alluding to. It's different from the factory pattern, but what's happening here is that we're saying by wrapping it in this factory method of the container that we want to execute this callback every time this session is, is accessed. So. And then we can uh, pass in parameters. So parameters might be stored in a config file. Uh, DevOps might control the parameters so that the developers work with one set of parameters and DevOps uh, provides another and we can um, add those in. And so then they're available within the scope of the, the Lambda here, the factory. So. Sorry, where would you actually, I mean, is that just like a config file that you would specify those parameters if you want the parameters? So in this example, they're not showing that part. It's up to you to implement it. But like here, we've got a string session ID. This might actually come from a config. So what, what they're demonstrating, though, is that we're, we're adding parameters um, external to the definition of the, of the callback that's the factory. So let's see. And then they've got additional methods so that um, if something should be immutable, we can, we can protect it. Um, it can be modified. Um, I don't know a use case off the top of my head why that'd be a good idea, but I'm sure that it came up you know, in implementation. They're like, we need to be able to do this. Um, but usually you, you want to handle it all up front. And then the container can be extended. Um, so here they show a provider implementation. And so this uses, uses the interface injection. So um, they're defining a register method that accepts the container. And so as it's um, constructing these objects, it's going to be passing the container into these factories. So, and here we register it with the, the parent class. What's going to happen is when we pass in this foo provider object into the register method, it's going to call register and it's going to pass the pimple object into itself so that you get the inversion of control. And then, again, if, if, I'm, if I'm just calling the array property here, it's going to return back the object. But if I want to actually get back the callback, then that's where I'd call raw. So that's the simplicity of Pimple itself. Now let's see if I have uh, Silex. It looks like I do. So Silex is another, it's a micro framework that's um, developed by um, Sensio Labs uh, as well, same, same uh, developers, Fabian Potentier and Symphony. Um, but 
uh, with Silex, it's a micro framework and it, it's built on top of Pimple. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the application class, but I'm going to talk through it and then show how these providers come into play. So what Silex is, is um, you start with an application class and then you register providers with it. The application class is actually an extension of the Pimple container. Um, and then it, it uh, adds a bunch of methods for um, bootstrapping all the other providers and, and the controllers and, and executing the, the lifecycle of the application. Um, but at its core, it, it's, it's a Pimple container. So now, in the providers here, um, I happen to have a serializer provider up on the cache on my browser here. And so, uh, let's see. We'll see that it implements the service provider interface. Um, and then we'll see that it accepts the, the container, which in this instance happens to be the app. So what this provider implementation does is it, is it takes in the app, and then it's going to add additional uh, dependencies to it. Um, so here, we're adding a serializer dependency. Um, directly to the app. So when it gets to the to the run method of the app, um, it's going to go through and execute all the methods in the container. Uh, and so that this is this is an example of how building on top of the container and using um, the interface injection we can we can achieve um, you know passing all the dependencies and going to a known location for it. So I've got one more tab here that was cached. Uh -huh. So going back to the D in solid, we have the dependency inversion principle. Um, and basically, we're saying that we should be relying on interfaces, not on implementations. Um, that way, uh, we expect an interface, not an actual concrete object. Um, so this, this is a good read. Um, I'll link to it uh, when I upload these slides uh, later today. So. Okay, so at this point, I just want to have a discussion and do a bit of Q&A. Um, and for those of you that have experience with dependency injection and have a different take on it, I'd love to, to have a, a more deeper discussion. Um, so I'd like to open it up to anybody who has any questions or comments. Mm -hmm. So you know what's the main difference between the entire and the my experience with Laravel was just brief. Um, I know there's some more experience in the room here. Um, with Laravel, it's um, behind a facade, um, so it's it's there's a little more to it. But in its uh, in its use, I think it's probably a little bit cleaner. Um, the goal of Pimple is just very lightweight. Um, it provides a container that could be added to legacy code, or or you could build a micro application on top of it. Um, so it's designed to be really simple. Um, so it uses reflection to kind of resolve dependencies as well that way. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more opinionated too, like with the use of facades and the use of reflection. So um, like Pete was saying about the constructor injection, right? Laravel actually goes in and checks what the method signature for your constructor is, and then it fills in those dependencies for you. Whereas Pimple doesn't do that. It expects you to be able to you know, configure it in a, a function. So Laravel takes a performance hit for that. It's kind of opinionated. It's good in a lot of cases, but you know it's a trade-off either way. Any others? 
How do you keep it disorganized in a large code base? So, um, I, in the Zen Framework 2 side, what we did is we broke it down to different service locators. Um, and so, uh, they're all configuration based. And so, each module has its own configuration that um, gets imported to the global inf uh, config service. Um, and so, every, every factory that, that when the, we call, make a call to the service locator, the service locator um, then goes to the config and, and figures out what factory to call. Um, then the factory has access to the config option, the config service, and all the other dependencies through the service locator that's passed in as well. Um, and so we break it down by module. And so we'll have, I think, 35 modules um, for all the different um, domain objects. And, and so uh, that's how we manage it. So. And so do you check, like when you're writing a unit test, for mm -hmm. example, one of the problems I've had is um, to, to test it, I need to you know, check actually inside of it, and I need to make sure that I'm configuring the, uh, the mocks correctly and, and doing that. Whereas, uh, like the Laravel way of, of having the, the mocks kind of passed in via reflection, um, have you noticed any trade-offs there, I guess? Yeah. Um, it, it goes back to how the service locator is utilized. Um, on some of our older code base, uh, we were using that service locator throughout the controllers and whatnot. And so we had to instantiate quite a series of dependencies within our unit tests just to get it to run. Um, whereas if, if we just limit it to the factory, then if we're actually unit testing the concrete class, we can just, A, just inject the dependencies and not even worry about the service locator. Um, but um, also, when we're testing the factory itself, um, I found it's most effective not to mock the service locator, but to actually just provide the services that, that we need um, and just keep it really simple there. So. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a mm -hmm. question just uh, when you're talking about going to the interface. But then you want to use something uh, you're trying to future proof it. Mm -hmm. In the future, there's new ways of doing things that you didn't learn aware of back when you built the interface. Um, so, have you dealt with that? And does it end up, you know, an idea that you can plug and play it, but it's not really that way when you actually get to try and use <coughs> your model DB versus. Yeah, like. Going from MySQL to Mongo is probably an extreme use case. I mean, it, it's it's probably more complicated than just that. But the, the idea there is that uh, if the interface is kept simple enough, that you can make that switch. And then internally, the code can be a lot more complex, but the interface is kept really simple. So um, we're not adding additional uh, public methods. We're not add, um, we're not adding additional parameters into our signatures. Um, we keep it really simple. So, for example. Instantiating um, a Mongo object is going to be completely different from a MySQL uh, connector. But uh, if, if you abstract it out to just a query method, um, it's going to be the same. You're going to pass in a query, and out comes a result set. Um, uh, but you have to have that layer of abstraction on top of it. Otherwise, otherwise the return uh, values and whatnot are too concrete. So. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I'm wondering that mm -hmm. layer of abstraction you ever run into, you know, when you do model, you just think of it and handle things differently than how you would do it. Uh, there, there's that. So, therefore, it's really hard to figure out that abstraction. There, there definitely are some challenges, um, and that's why um, I definitely recommend um, using an iterative process and, and just um, frequently reviewing and refactoring and. Um, uh, for us, as we're as we're growing our um, junior team, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing code reviews and, and keep things on track because a lot of times, um, both implementation and domain logic will start to leak in, and we want to keep it um, you know clean so that, that it's usable for as many use cases as possible. Mm -hmm. and I just want to add that you have to separate uh, model itself. There are two levels: the domain model and persistence model. So your persistent, some, sometimes people just mix it together, especially on simple projects. Just let's say you have your MySQL database, you create your model, right? And what your model does is just ask me, keep 
sending queries to the victims and rub it up to some requirement. So you have to separate that logic. You have domain logic that just keeps business rules within itself. And you have persistence where where you easily can switch only with your SQL because the code functions would be the same for each of them. So your calls to databases would be the same. This way the uh, persistence interface will be the same. So it's going to be easy to swap between one of the as well. So that's how it works. Yeah, my examples are way oversimplified. Um, but what would be happening in like a mapper layer here is that the mapper would be this anti-corruption layer that would um, interact with the database um, so that the domain model that's on top of it. So user mapper would return a user object. The user object should have no knowledge of its persistence layer. It shouldn't know whether the back end is Mongo or MySQL or whatnot. Uh, the mapper is, is bridging that gap there. So, um, so the mapper would need to be potentially changed if we change the database. Um, but uh, the mapper interface that, that the application is operating with, the signatures might still be the same as far as mapping, but the implementation of the mapper would change. Um, by, by, you know, for example, um, injecting a different adapter. So that adapter and injection go hand in hand because we're going to have different adapters for different um, services and we'll be able to inject them. The other benefit to, to doing that, just to add on, is that you know if you're doing test cases or something like that, you can have like an in-memory adapter, mm -hmm. where you just you know, or an in-memory persistence layer where it just puts it in like an array or something, and so then you can very easily mock that and check without having to spin up a DB server or you know a Mongo server or whatever, right? So you you have all these options that you can do, and you don't have to um, other objects don't have to have knowledge of that layer. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I guess I was just wondering, yeah, like, when you actually build it out, what issues right. run into that I'm not aware of. <laughs> right. And so, so like, yeah, and I guess, you know, switching from, yeah, MySQL to a file based system that, yeah, if you set up your user map right to begin with, then sure, it works fine. But in reality, do you actually forget a couple of things? You have to come back and touch this guy anyway. And so then, do you really get the benefit of, you know, I mean, you have to refactor anyway. So whether you refactor here or Somewhere else you're going to build. Right. So and I mean, you rarely come out with, you know, design that's perfect to begin with. And like, that's what Pete was saying with the whole, you know, you, an iterative process, you refactor all the time. Um, but you kind of, like, the more you work on the, the domain, the more you start to realize, oh, like, this could just be abstracted out. Or we made a mistake in the past there, so we're not going to make that mistake again. We're going to have another layer of abstraction here. Um, or, like, we've never even used this layer of abstraction. We can probably get rid of it. Does that help answer? Yeah, yeah, it helps. Yeah, maybe a practical example to help think the trade off on these things are usually about performance. Um, so, like in Drupal 7, DB, TNG, we implemented uh, merge, right, as per the ANSI SQL. Uh, turns out, um, MySQL doesn't implement <laughs> merge, uh, neither does Postgres, neither does anything else except Oracle. Right. right, not a lot of good to most uh, Drupal users, and there's significant performance gains there. So, um, you know, because of the life cycle of Drupal 7, we need to keep our interfaces static for several years. You know, we, we have hacks in my hacks in the MySQL layer, you know, to make DB merge work, which is less performant than the way we could do it if, you know, we used it in the native MySQL way. But that's the trade-off we make in order to keep the interface stable. If your priority is keeping the interface stable, you take the performance hit in the implementation. If if you're just working on an internal project and you don't have other people depending on your APIs, you probably change your interface more, right? So it depends on the needs of your project. But I, I kind of have a question spinning mm -hmm. off this. You know, a lot of projects start really small and grow bigger. And so at what point do you decide to use Pimple as opposed to um, you know, just saying, okay, I'm going to pass all my objects into the constructor? Yeah, that, right. Because you know, abstraction layers aren't free. Yeah. Um, so I've always favored maintainability over performance. I think that performance can be picked up in other parts of the architecture. So, like, like for example, I rely on Varnish um, to to capture the the output and cache it. And so, as long as it the page builds in a reasonable time, um, I mean that's acceptable to me because it'll it'll the Varnish will pick it up and cache it, and then all the Sub, um, 
the request will happen. On a small project... Yeah, it doesn't necessarily guarantee maintainability either, right? True. An array of objects is pretty maintainable, in my opinion. Yeah. You pass an array of objects and every constructor. Yeah. Um, for me, Pimple is lightweight and simple enough that I'd use it from the get-go. Like, I think Silex is a great little micro-framework that, that leverages it. And so for, you know, a, a simple site, I, I would probably start off that way. Um, you know, on, on our platform where we're using, you know, 35 modules or whatnot, um, you know, we've, we've gone to more advanced, um, you know, service locators and whatnot, um, and it becomes far more important. But um, I, I would use it from the get-go. I mean, that, that's my take on it. Um, because a lot of times when something needs to scale up, we're not ready for it because you're, the need for, to scale up is because so much is happening. And so um, I would start with it. I mean, that's just my opinion on it. Um, I think it's also simple enough that you can add it into a legacy code base. Um, I don't have a ton of Drupal experience. I was a WordPress guy, um, but <laughs> I, I'm no more. So um, you know, I, you can you can still lend better practices to a code base by by you know bringing it in, and consolidating things, and having that location to go back, and go and get your dependencies and whatnot. Um, going back to the the part about the the static interfaces and whatnot. Um, uh, uh, bad habit I used to see, or bad habit in my opinion, would be you know you need an additional dependency because you change something on, on the underlying implementation, and so you'd pass an additional object through the through the uh, method signature. So you just add another parameter. So say you need access to the database connection, you pass it through the method, and then do your query, and then and then off you go. Um, by using uh, like like the factory and the setter injection and whatnot, we can we can add in dependencies without changing the signature of the, the method being called. Um, so we can change the, the private methods, but still maintain a public, sig uh, public signature for the method being called there. So. To bounce off that, that performance idea, I mean, at the end of the day, we are using PHP. It's not the most performant thing in the world. Like, if performance is really a concern, then maybe PHP isn't the right route, there, right? Um, so I guess there's, there's probably a band where you care enough about performance that you don't want to use something like Pimple, um, but you don't care enough about performance that you don't want to switch to something like Go faster or like, you know, even, even Java frameworks, right? Once the JVM gets running, super fast. So like, how big is that band where the performance for Pimple is too much of a hit if you're okay with the performance? I'm more concerned about the complexity. Right. Padding. Right, and it, I think that's one reason why I, I like Pimple compared to the Laravel uh, system because Pimple, once you, you think about it, it's basically just like you were saying, an array of objects. Um, at least that's what the outward interface looks like. Mm -hmm. It's doing a little bit of magic inside, but not a lot. And you can actually look at the code and it's, it's fairly readable. Um, but it, it acts just like an array of objects. You can be like, okay, so we're just running our DB and, and the key here is DB. And to me, that's a lot more explainable to uh, a junior dev than saying, yeah, you just have to type in and, and do this stuff with Laravel and make sure you're calling the app main and all this stuff. So, so they're using some other array that doesn't have that magic. Right, 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 right. Well, but then at that point, I mean, you're going to run into the problems with junior developers all over the code base if they don't get that, right? That's true. We should just get That's yeah. what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's not something I practice, but it's one of those ideals where, you know, theoretically you could have um, a mid or senior level developer handling the setting up the, the dependencies and then having a junior work within the scope of the application and just consuming it as an array of objects, you know. Um, so it, it, until they're to that level where they, they do, you know, pick it up. So. Right, or even just not let them have access to anything that's below the like, factory level. Yeah. So, they are given, um, or there's a factory created by a mid or, or senior level developer, and then anything past that is the junior's territory. Yeah. Um, and then that way they don't even have to worry about this, and they can just listen to like, I need these dependencies, and the factory method will create it. You know, like, if, if you're that concerned about you know, junior developers messing up your code base. 
Cameron, did you ever touch any of the platform code? Okay. Um, so, like, one of the things we were broken up into, um, we had senior devs working on the platform code, um, and then we had another web team who was implementing projects on top of the platform code. Um, so we do a, we do a lot of that um, lay work of building the dependencies inside these modules, and then for the web team consuming it, they just add the modules via composer, and it, it came in and it worked. They just accessed the the object they needed and they used it. Um, so that's a way of splitting up the the work as well. So. Okay. Uh, anything else? Great. It sounds like there's a networking opportunity out here. So that's, <laughs> that's all I got. So thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you.